2017, some 1 billion Six hundred eighty-six million deaths, violent deaths. That's not counting the the wounded. That's not counting all the people who lost a brother or a son or a father or so forth. And that's not counting also the physical expense. Uh, in the United States alone, since we've ignored Our Lady of Fatima, just the United States alone, not because they're more important, but because we have the numbers for them. They have spent over one trillion five hundred sixty-four billion dollars on warfare, just since 1917. Um, this is not the only cost by any means, but it's cost that we can measure. And so, yet I hear people saying, "I can do nothing." I hear lay people say that. I hear priests say that. I hear bishops say that. I hear cardinals say that. So if we can do nothing, but all we must do is sit back and wait for the inevitable Antichrist to come, then we are indeed in a very sore and sad position. I don't believe that God leaves us in this way, that he has given us possibilities, he has given us answers, he has given us ways, even though we're not the Pope, even though we're not all the bishops, even though we're none of these people, nevertheless, we are not helpless. If we think we are helpless, we will find out when the punishment comes that we should have thought better, we should think differently. But it seems that everyone is afraid. They don't want to be laughed at, they don't want to be stand out, they don't want to be considered singular they think that there's strength in numbers. I knew a man who had cancer, and uh, I've known more than one, actually, who the doctors tell him, we can do nothing for you. All we can do is send you home to die. Now, there are other doctors who say, uh, we can help you if you take our regime. It's nothing special, nothing painful, a little unusual by the world's standards, but it will cure you or the chances are curing you is about 80%. And yet, more than once, the people would rather not look, appear to be foolish, they would rather be killed by cancer because they would rather not go against what the mainstream or what the common opinion is. I think our worst fear is ourselves. We don't want to look like we're strange or we don't want to stand out. But unfortunately, we are being asked to stand out. We are being asked to do something unlike our contemporaries. We're asked to, first of all, think for ourselves. If the Blessed Virgin tells us that only I can help you, the Blessed Virgin tells us, as she told Lucy to tell the Pope, I'm still awaiting the consecration of Russia. Without that consecration, Russia cannot convert. Without that consecration, the world cannot have peace. It's quite absolute. Without the consecration of Russia, the world cannot have peace. We've had all sorts of plans for peace. We have, if you go start from more recent times, you have George Bush having a war on terror to bring peace. So far, we don't have any more peace. We have a lot more dead people, perhaps in the millions in the last few years in Iraq, Afghanistan. We don't have any more peace. We have the general on the ground, General David Petraeus, who tells us that this war will go on for the next two generations. This is the best they have to offer us for world peace, is war for the next two generations. Why do we have to wait for someone else to speak up? Why do we have to wait when we ourselves have a tongue, when we ourselves know the truth? when we ourselves can talk to those around us. We are not without resources. We must remember the children at Fatima. They told no one, or more exactly, Jacinta told her mother, and the word spread, and 50 people in June came, not because the children asked them to come, but they came themselves. Now these 50 people in June told their friends and neighbors. As a result of those 50 people, 
5,000 people came in July. So they didn't have radio, they didn't have television, they didn't have newspapers, they didn't have advertising, they had nothing but talking to their friends. So the power of 50 people to tell 5,000 people to come is not insignificant. And those 5,000 people told their friends and 15,000 came in August. And they told their friends and 30,000 came in September. And those 30,000 people told their friends. Now remember, it's not just that they told their friends. The government had the army out to prevent the people from coming in October. That they, so that besides the military being against them, the newspapers were making fun of them. The government was persecuting the children, putting them in jail and threatening them with death. And the priests were afraid. They didn't want to lose their parishes. They had been persecuted by the Masons in the government and they didn't want to lose any more parishes. So they discouraged the people from coming. Yet despite all this, 70,000 people came because although none of them were powerful, none of them had any power in the press or the newspapers or in the church, nevertheless, they told their friends. 70,000 people is not a small number. And that happened because people did what they could. All of us can do something. All of us can tell our friends. And if some of our friends laugh at us, let us not that make that worry, worry us. It's, if they're not worthy to hear the message, then go to others. You'll be surprised if some people you expected to listen don't listen. You'll be surprised that some people you don't expect to listen will be very much touched by this message. So we can do a lot. And in fact, since for whatever reason up to now, God has not given the grace to the Pope to do the consecration for whatever reason, he has given us nevertheless the knowledge of the message of Fatima and the knowledge of the requests of Our Lady. So he expects us to do something with that. I'm not quite sure what it takes for people to, to notice um, do we don't pay attention to it because it's not in the Catholic press? Because it's not in the daily press? Do we don't pay attention because it's not in our schools? Um, maybe we say, well, we need the right people. We need enough people. And we're not the right people or enough people. So we have to overcome this lie we tell ourselves, this excuse we make to ourselves that we can do nothing. So the first thing we can do is we can pray. That's the most important thing, to pray and make sacrifices. Our Lady spoke by teaching the children prayer. First, the angel taught them the prayer, My God, I believe in Thee, I adore Thee, I hope in Thee, and I love Thee. I ask pardon for all those who do not believe, who do not adore, who do not hope, and do not love Thee. This prayer the angel taught them, and the angel taught them also how to pray it, when they were by themselves to prostrate on the ground with their forehead touching the ground, and to repeat this prayer over again, hour after hour. In fact, they spent from some time around 10 or 11 in the morning to about eight o'clock at night, praying this prayer the first day the angel came to them. The angel taught them the second prayer to also pray in adoration, to pray as prostrate. O most holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I adore thee most profoundly, and I offer up to thee the most precious body and blood, soul and divinity of the same Son, Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world, in reparation for the blasphemies, the outrages, and the indifferences by which he himself is offended. And I draw upon the infinite merits of the most sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary, that you might convert poor sinners. So the angel taught them to pray, to pray in adoration, in, ad in hope, in, in faith, and in charity, in love, and to ask pardon for all the sinners who do not pray, who do not adore, do not hope, and do not love God. He also taught them to offer the merits of the most sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary, and to offer the most precious body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ present in the most blessed sacrament. And to make this prayer in reparation that our Lord is offended by these sins and also to pray for the conversion of sinners. Again, reparation and prayer and sacrifices. 
The Blessed Virgin taught the children to pray. These prayers we should learn, we should remember, they are printed on our various cards. When Our Lady opened her hands on May 13th, and the light fell from her hands into the hearts of the children, she said, the children actually prayed this prayer together without ever learning it before. They said all together at the same time, O most holy Trinity, I adore thee, my God, my God, I love thee in the most blessed sacrament. So here again, we see from talking about belief in God to then belief in the most holy Trinity. And again, belief in the blessed sacrament. All of these things are taught by prayer and taught by the example of the children. The Blessed Virgin taught them to, another prayer to say at the end of each decade, O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need. This is the prayer that is taught to pray at the end of every decade of the rosary. So we ask God, first of all, to forgive us our sins, and then we pray for all those who need God's mercy to save them from hell. The Blessed Virgin on the same day, that was on July 13th, she also taught them the prayer to pray when you make a sacrifice. O oh my Jesus, it is for love of thee, for the conversion of sinners, and in reparation for sins against the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I offer this sacrifice to thee. The children were taught to pray and make sacrifices for sinners. One day when Lucy was speaking, Lucy and Francesca were speaking to some pilgrims, the children were asked, did Our Lady ask you to pray for sinners? And Lucy surprisingly said, no. So when Francesco was with Lucy by himself, he said, but she did tell us to pray for sinners. And Lucy corrected him and said, no, she asked us to pray and make sacrifices for sinners. I'm reminded of the story of the Curie of ours who was asked by a parish priest not far from ours. The parish priest asked him, why does God not hear my prayers for the conversion of the parish sinner? And the Curie of ours said, he said, I've been praying a long time and God doesn't hear my prayers. And the Curie of ours said, have you offered sacrifices as well? If you offer sacrifices, God will hear your prayer. And so the parish priest did some fasting for the sinner. And a few weeks later, the parish priest came to tell the cure of ours, my sinner has now converted. So Lucy tells us uh, we should not only pray, but pray and make sacrifices for sinners. Our Lord himself taught two prayers. And these prayers are the ones that are not spoken about by almost any other uh, group that promotes Fatima. These prayers were taught by our Lord to Lucy in 1931, in August. Lucy had been praying for the conversion of Russia and Spain, for the conversion of Portugal and Europe, and for the whole world. And our Lord spoke to her and said, you please me very much when you pray for the conversion of those poor peoples. I'd like to first point out that our Lord knows it's not just Russia that needs conversion. It's Spain, it's Portugal, it's Europe, it's the whole world. So it's not about Russia is bad and the rest of us are all good. It's the fact is that God knows we all need conversion and he's very pleased by Lucy's prayers for conversion of all these countries and for the whole world. Our Lord said, I'm pleased with your prayers. Now ask this also of my mother. So then Jesus taught two prayers for Lucy and for us to say often. And the first prayer is, Sweetheart of Mary, be the salvation of Russia, Spain, Portugal, Europe, and the whole world. Sweetheart of Mary. Here we have Jesus referring to his mother as Sweetheart of Mary. Sweetheart of Mary, be the salvation of Russia, Spain, Portugal, Europe, and the whole world. When I offer these prayers, Depending where I am, I also add in the countries, Sweetheart of Mary be the salvation of Russia, Spain, Portugal, Europe, Canada, United States, Italy, and the whole world. You may add in your own country, of course. Lucy was praying for her two countries, her adopted country of Spain and her native country of Portugal. And the second prayer that our Lord taught for us to pray for our countries 
is by the pure and immaculate conception, O Mary, obtain for me the conversion of Russia, Spain, Portugal, Europe, and the entire world. By thy pure and immaculate conception, O Mary, obtain for me the conversion of Russia, Spain, Portugal, Europe, and the entire world. So these are prayers. There are seven prayers taught at Fatima, and we should use all seven prayers. But Our Lady especially insisted that we pray the rosary. Every time she came at Fatima, she talked about the rosary. Pray the rosary every day in order to, in, uh, in order to obtain peace for the world. That's what she said in May 13th. Every time she came at Fatima, she carried the rosary in her hand. And every time she came at Fatima, she spoke about the rosary. We should see that Our Lady has her rosary. In June, she said, I wish you to come here on the 13th of next month and to pray the rosary each day. In July, continue praying the rosary every day in honor of Our Lady of the Rosary in order to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war because only she can help you. Only she, that is, Our Lady identified herself as the Lady of the Rosary. Only she can help us. That is where we get the motto on our, up here, only she can help us, because she told us that. In fact, uh, there are those who work for the definition of the mediatrix of all graces, that, that Mary is the mediatrix in, of all graces in which she is. I believe that that definition will happen after the consecration, when we will see the practical uh, results of recognizing Our Lady as mediatrix of all graces. And we recognize then that only she can help us. But she continues in August, I want you to continue praying the rosary every day. In September, continue to say the rosary and to obtain the end of the war. In October, I am Our Lady of the Rosary, continue to say the rosary every day. So every time she came, she spoke about the rosary. Every time she came, she carried the rosary. Every time she came, she insisted that we pray the rosary. So it's hard to avoid understanding that we are not without resources. As Lucy has told us, that there's no problem in the world, either national or international, there's no problem either physical or spiritual that cannot be solved by the rosary. The Curie of ours tells us that, I know a man more powerful than God, it's he who prays. The man who prays gets God to, who said no to say yes. So let us pray up to now, God has not given the grace to the Pope to do the consecration. We must pray insistently and fervently. We have had several million rosaries campaigns for this, but obviously it's not enough. So we encourage you to continue to pray the rosary for the Pope to do the consecration. Again, when Our Lady came in 1925 for the communions of reparation, she had explained that her heart was pierced by these thorns. In fact, it was the child Jesus who explained this to Lucy. And Our Lady said, you at least try to console me and announce in my name that I promise to assist at the moment of death with all the graces necessary for salvation, all those who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months shall confess, receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the rosary and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the 15 mysteries of the rosary with the intention of making reparation to me. So we should pray the rosary in reparation, especially on the first Saturday. Pray the rosary and meditate on the 15 mysteries of the rosary. Again, um, it is well for us to reflect upon that we have this power of the rosary, that we can change the course of mankind by praying the rosary and by praying for the consecration of Russia. Sacrifices. In, August, in summertime, the angel told the children to make sacrifices and Lucy asked how are to make a sacrifice and he answered, make of everything you can a sacrifice and offer to God as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and in supplication for the conversion of sinners. In, that was in 1916. In 1917, on July 13th, the Blessed Virgin said, sacrifice yourself for sinners and 
Pray many times, especially when you make a sacrifice. O oh, Jesus, it is for love of you, for the conversion of sinners, and reparation for sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So, we need to keep in mind that although things may seem impossible, that the more we look out there, we see that, as um, speakers of this conference will point out, that the plans of the devil for the New World Order that they've been planning since 18, 1730, they, this plans of the Masons, the plans of the anti-God forces, uh, the plans of Karl Marx, who worked for the Masons as well, all of these plans, which we see outlined, you can read their plans written in 250 years ago, you can read their plans and you can see them being carried out before our eyes. It would seem that nothing can stop them. But nevertheless, we have the promise of Our Lady that in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. In the end means that there is a time, there's a long battle. It takes some time before she wins. But in the end, she does win. It really is up to us to choose the right side even though it looks like it's the losing side right now, and to stay faithful to her, and we will see, either here or hereafter, her triumph. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me. Russia will be converted, and a certain period of peace will be given to the world. I think it's hard for people, they think of Our Lady of Lourdes, for example, or Our Lady of Pont Main, or other apparitions of Our Lady. All of them are important, but Fatima is unique in all these apparitions. There have been 14,400 wars in the history of mankind for the last 6,000 years. 14,400 wars. That's about two wars and a half every year. This warfare has increased in our time, in the last 100 years, and even more in our own time, so that we have these phenomenal numbers never before seen in mankind's history of people being violently put to death by their fellow men. Yet we're told that the promise of peace, that mankind, not just Russia, not just the United States, not just this part or that part, but the whole world will enjoy a period of peace. If we think back of the prophecies that Isaiah, that Micaeus, and other Old Testament prophets have made. For example, if I recall correctly from memory, Micaeus tells us they will learn the art of war no more. They will learn the art of war no more. Every generation has taught the succeeding generation how to make war. This period of peace given to mankind, promised to mankind, will last longer than a generation. They will learn the art of war no more. If you think of the one trillion five hundred billion dollars that the United States alone has spent that we that they count on warfare, not counting armaments, and you turn them to either scientific uh, research or you f turn that to agriculture or you turn that to education, or you turn that to any other beneficial activity for mankind, there would be no more want, no more poverty, no more hunger. This will happen. In the words of Isaiah, we're told that they will turn their swords into plowshares. Instead of taking our money and turning it into some instrument of destruction, we will turn it into some instrument of feeding our own people, feeding the people of the world. This has never been seen in the history of mankind, and yet it is promised. It is promised and it will be fulfilled with the message of Fatima being obeyed. We have the promise from the first chapters of the Bible, chapter 3, verse 15, that the devil will fight against the woman and her seed, and the woman and her seed will fight against the devil, and that the devil will lie in wait for her, and she will crush the devil's head with her heel. 
That has not taken place, although it does take place in little battles. We're talking about the final battle. In fact, Lucy tells us that the devil's in mood for the final battle. He thinks he can win. And he's waging this war and he's expecting us. The first rule of the devil is to be discouraged. First rule of the devil is to say, why fight? Why resist? You can do nothing. And that is what we need to realize that we can do a lot and that we have to wait for God's way of doing it, but there's at the same time things that he expects us to do while we're waiting. And as I mentioned, first of all, prayer and sacrifices. But instead, people would rather tell themselves, I can do nothing more. Why do we have to wait for the government to have another plan, to have more taxes, to have us have pay for more wars, or to have more government programs that we exhaust ourselves working hard and not achieving anything. We have the guarantee of heaven that this is a plan that will work. But instead, we accept the leadership of men telling us we must pay more taxes, we must have more wars, we must have more liturgical experiments, we must do anything and everything but do what already said. It is time for us to think and listen. Think for ourselves by listening to what Aridi tells us. When she says, only I can help you, when she says, without that consecration, the world cannot have peace. Without that consecration, Russia cannot be converted. I could discourse and say why I believe that to be the case, and you would say that's very interesting, but the fact is, this is what she said. So what can we do? Well, as I mentioned, pray and sacrifice. The second thing is get others to pray and make sacrifices. We should also become more aware. It seems that everyone has an opinion on Fatima, but they know next to nothing about Fatima. But they have an opinion. When they hear one thing, they hear some objection in their mind, and then they go off. I would say before they start doing that, they should learn more. These objections have been answered over and over again, both by the angel and by Our Lady and by our Lord himself. And if that's not enough, certainly by all that's been written on the subject by now. The third thing we can do is by petitioning. There's some think that is somehow or other disloyal, that we are being disloyal to the Pope when we ask him to do the consecration. Now seven popes from Pius XI, Pius XII, John XXIII, Paul VI, John Paul I, he was hardly a pope for very long, John Paul II and Benedict XVI have not done the consecration. Pius XII did a consecration of the world in 1942. He did it twice in that year, uh, in October and again in December. Now there were blessings to be received. In fact, Lucy was uh, her confessors were getting tired. The request for the consecration had been given in 1929. And so by 1940, her confessors had already tried for 11 years to convince the Pope to do the consecration of Russia. They were losing patience. I can understand that. So her confessor, who was also a bishop, told her to ask for the consecration of the world instead. Now Lucy knew that this was not the message of Our Lady of Fatima but she wanted to be obedient to her confessor, but she knew that this would not, this is not what Our Lady asked for. So what was she to do? She went before the Blessed Sacrament on the 24th of October, 1940, and asked our Lord, what should she do? So Jesus talked to her and said, for the consecration of the world, I will shorten the days of the present distress, meaning the Second World War but world peace is not for that. There's a promise attached to the consecration of Russia, which is world peace. The promise our Lord gave her for the consecration of the world was ending the Second World War shorter than it would have been otherwise. Sister Lucy wrote a letter to the Pope according to her confessor's directions and rewrote it and he re-edited it again and again to finally it was sent to the Pope the Pope in 1942 did the consecration of the world. 
He did it on October 31st by a radio message to Fatima and to Portugal, and he repeated that again on December the 8th, 1942. Our Lord spoke to Lucy after the, this consecration and said that he would shorten the days of the Second World War. Winston Churchill, writing in his sixth volume book about the Second World War, doesn't relate it to this act of consecration, but he says that the hinges of fate changed and that every battle before the end of 42, the Allies pretty well lost them all. But every battle after that, the Allies won almost every one of them. And this change, our Lord tells us, basically was due to the consecration of the world by the Pope in 1942. So I'm not here to suggest that consecrations of the world are useless or are bad, but they are not what our Lord asked for, and they cannot be used to substitute what our Lord asked for and what our Lady asked for. So it's important for us to realize that there are enemies to our Lady. Not everyone who opposes us is an enemy, but not everyone who opposes us is doing it out of goodwill either. There are false friends of Fatima who try to tell us that the consecration of the world is the consecration of Russia and that we've already had the conversion of Russia and that we've had world peace. It's amazing that these people lack one essential element which is called love for the truth. Did the Blessed Virgin come at Fatima six times? Did she work the miracle of the sun so that we could have 42 million babies killed in their mother's wombs every year? This is world peace? So that the United States can be bombing the people of Afghanistan or uh, people of Iran or wherever else or sending drones after somebody they don't like and killing them. This is world peace? And yet you will have people who claim to be devoted to Our Lady telling us, I prefer to think that they're so ignorant that they don't know what they're saying. But it's hard to believe that all of them are that ignorant. So we have the obligation, if we're going to do something about Fatima, the Pope would like to do the consecration. The previous Pope would like to do the consecration. But why don't they do it? Because the intellectual atmosphere and the social atmosphere, in their judgment, is not sufficiently favorable to them standing out and doing this by themselves. This Pope, as I've mentioned before, has actually asked the Russian Patriarch for permission to consecrate Russia. Why does he do that? Because he's acting under either the false theological idea that he needs their permission, or he's acting under a prudential judgment which he thinks he cannot do this if they don't give their consent. Either way, it is these false ideas that are preventing the Pope from acting. And therefore, it's important for us to realize that we as members of society, members of the church, have an obligation to help inform the public opinion. So the Pope will have right counsel and have right ideas around him. You are part of public opinion. And so you can do something about it. The first thing is to learn it yourself, and the second thing is to pass it on to others. So we have the spiritual weapons, which are the first thing we've talked about, prayers and sacrifices, reparation, and the sacraments well received. Next, we must talk about the truth, our own attitude towards the truth. We must love the truth. We must seek it. We must defend it. We must promote it, and we must pass it on. And then we must make, deepen it as well. And by passing it on, we pass it on by word of mouth, by TV, by telling others to watch us on TV, for example. Unless people know they can watch the whole program of this conference on television, they will never know it's there. You can pass it on by radio and by the website. You can pass it on by reading books and passing them on and so forth. So we can petition the Holy Father. Now I started to say that people have the idea that to petition the Holy Father is somehow an act of disloyalty. I remember Father uh, Gobi, 
Father Gobi had the Marian movement of priests. He died not so long ago. And in his messages to Our Lady four different times, he reports that Our Lady said to him, the consecration of Russia is not done. The dates were on the same day of the 25th of March, 1984. Our Lady said, the consecration of Russia is not done. She repeated that on June the 10th, 1987. She repeated again on 13th of May, 1990. And there's a fourth time. Father Gobi had a problem while he was at Fatima and hearing at Fatima Our Lady saying the consecration is not done. She goes to the, he goes to the sanctuary and listens to the Bishop of Fatima saying, uh, don't bother the Holy Father with petitions because he's tired and he's old and he doesn't want to hear this anymore. And so he's, he's finding himself drawn by two loyalties. One is his love for the Pope and the other is his love for Our Lady. And how does he resolve this? He resolves it the, way, the wrong way, the way most people do, is by not asking the Pope. I've explained more than once over the years that first of all, if the faithful have a right, not because I gave it to them, it's actually defined in the Catholic Church. It's defined twice. It's solemnly defined, it's an act of faith, you must believe it, that in matters pertaining to ecclesiastical jurisdiction, every member of the faithful have a right to appeal to the Pope directly. You can find that in the Second Council of Lyon in 1274, and you can find it defined again in the First Vatican Council in 1870. Both of them say the same thing. Both say that the faithful have a right to appeal directly to the Pope, which is another way of saying you have a right to petition the Holy Father. That is your God-given right. God didn't give you that right just because he liked what you look like. He gave us that right because he expects us to use it when necessary. So you have a right, and I would say an obligation, although some might disagree with me, to petition the Holy Father for the consecration of Russia. And I will say, I'll be the first to admit that if there's only one person ever does this, and you're not alone, by the way, there's more than five million have done this, but if you're only one person who does this, of course, he's a busy man and he will put it aside and do nothing with it. But at some point, when enough people petition the Holy Father, now is that all one billion Catholics? No, I don't think that's necessary. Is it half a billion Catholics? No, that's not necessary either. But it's gonna be more than five million at some point when we petition the Holy Father, enough of us, and we petition the bishops, I can tell you, for example, in a diocese in Texas, it was only 300 people that spoke to the bishop, only 300. Now in a diocese of a million people, 300 is not very much. 300 people encouraged the bishop there to talk to the Pope about the consecration. How hard is it to get 300 people in every diocese. There's a total of 2,500 dioceses. And it doesn't mean you have to be in the member of that diocese. The same 300 people could go to five or 10 dioceses. So if you divide 2,500 by approximately 10, you get 250 times 300. It's not that much when you consider the fate of the world hangs on it. So we can petition the Holy Father and we can get others to petition the Holy Father for the consecration of Russia. So these are simple things, but nevertheless, things that we can do. This choice of ours then is to pray, to volunteer, to sacrifice, to learn, to teach, and to pass on all this to others. And I think that we have, uh, perhaps if there's some questions, people wonder, I just have seen time and again people explaining to themselves, excusing themselves, I'm only a bishop, I can do nothing. Well, I could say this, the bishops have a lot of power to do something very simple. They don't even have to talk to the Pope if they don't want to. All they have to do is promote the five first Saturdays in their diocese. The request for the consecration of Russia and world peace is also tied to the five first Saturdays. And we should remember the what happened in 1917, Our Lady said she would come back <coughs> to Russia in 
to ask for the, conf con the communions of reparation on the first Saturdays. So in 1925, on December the 10th, Lucy was in her room and the child Jesus came standing on a cloud and the Blessed Virgin, Our Lady of Fatima, was beside him. And the Blessed Virgin had in her hand, in her right hand, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, all surrounded with thorns. And the child Jesus spoke first and pointed to Our Lady's heart and said, Behold the heart of your mother. He didn't say, Behold the heart of my mother. He said, Behold the heart of your mother, all circled with thorns, which ungrateful men put there at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. The Blessed Virgin laid her hand on Lucy's shoulder and she spoke to her and said, Behold my heart which ungrateful men pierce at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. Do you at least seek to console me by making reparation and announce in my name that I promise to come at the hour of death with all the graces necessary for salvation to those souls who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months shall go to confession, receive Holy Communion, pray five decades of the Rosary and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the mysteries of the rosary, doing this with the intention of making reparation to my Immaculate Heart. Perhaps we should think about this for a moment. Why does our Lord say, your mother, and not my mother? On the cross, Jesus said to St. John, behold your mother. At Fatima, our Lord is saying, behold the heart of your mother. Why is she our mother? The Second Vatican Council, interestingly enough, is not the only place that's explained in the Church's teaching, but explains it very well when it says that the Blessed Virgin Mary generates, generavit in Latin, generates us into the life of grace. St. Peter tells us in Sacred Scripture that, that we are made godlike, we are adopted sons by grace. And so this God-likeness quality, which the Council of Trent tells us is a created quality, this is divine life. It transforms us. But this sanctifying grace, or this divine life, this created divine life in us, is generated in our hearts, in our souls, by the Blessed Virgin Mary. That she is the one who brings us forth to new birth, when our Lord says in St. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 16, if I recall, unless you be born again of water and the Holy Spirit. So baptism is really a rebirth, but we are not reborn without a mother. The Blessed Virgin is the one who gives us spiritual rebirth. And just as she is the mother of Jesus, of a person who pre-exists, He's a divine person, nevertheless a person who pre-existed. She becomes his mother in, by giving birth to him in his human form. Similarly, she becomes our spiritual mother, giving us birth in supernatural form. And so she is truly and strictly speaking our mother. She is as much our mother as our own natural mother is. Now you can see just the depth of just this one word when the Lord says, Behold the heart of your mother. Behold the heart of your mother, he says. And yet, there's so much meaning in that one phrase. Now the Pope and the bishops and the priests can all promote the devotion of the five first Saturdays to make reparation for the ingratitude. How is it that we are ingrateful? Well, as, again, we can go back to sacred scripture, St. Bernard, for example, explaining the, the uh, Annunciation, the Blessed Virgin is asked by the angel to be the mother of God. She doesn't hesitate, but she takes a moment to consider it. And St. Bernard tells us, ask the Blessed Virgin, please don't hesitate. We're all waiting. We're all dependent on you and your answer. May it be yes. Hurry, please. We are all indebted to the Blessed Virgin for her answer. 
because as we know that uh, the um, as we know the grace of redemption comes through sacrifice through the blood of Christ there's no redemption from sin says St. Paul without there's no redemption from sin without the shedding of blood and we are redeemed from sin by the shedding of Christ's blood but he would not have any blood to shed if he never became man and he would never become man unless the Blessed Virgin had said first fiat let it be done unto me according to thy word now the Blessed Virgin knew the scriptures well she knew the prophecies of Isaiah. She knew that, that the, the Christ would be the suffering servant. That in chapter 53, which describes his sufferings even in more detail than the Gospels, she knew all this, that when she said yes, she would become the mother of sorrows. And so her accepting of the motherhood of God was also accepting to become the mother of sorrows. And she did that out of love for God, but also out of love for each one of us. So when our Lord talks about the ingratitude of men, because we do not acknowledge, we do not thank her, we do not remember, we do not think about what she has done for us. These are things that we can do and we can promote the uh, devotion of the first Saturdays. And the bishops can promote that. They don't need to have any committees. They don't need to have anyone else's permission. All they need to do is have these practices promoted widely in their dioceses day in and day out, year in and year out and they will draw down many graces on themselves and on their parishes and on their parish families. So we are not without resources and if we all did what we could we would see the atmosphere in the church change but we're all waiting for someone else to do something. We're all waiting for the leaders. We're all just nobodies we say to ourselves but that's just a big excuse. We have the power among us collectively here, when you consider that the gospel was spread to the whole world by 12 men, and you consider that among them, St. Paul excelled them all, so that if we had more zeal, if we had more faith, we could do more. But let us not reproach ourselves so much as ask for that faith, for that zeal, and let us do what we can with what's at our hand. There are many things that you can find out, if I've not given you enough to give you here, that you can do. I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, there's thousands of things. As St. Thomas tells us, that men of goodwill can differ among themselves about the courses of action. And everyone has opportunities and graces and gifts that other, other people do not have. So there's no way I can speak of every possible way you can do it, but all of you can do the prayers and the sacrifices. All of us can tell our friends and neighbors about it. All of us can learn more about the message of Fatima. All of us can be more fervent in our application of the, the message of prayer and sacrifice. Uh, there's still more to talk about as we go on this week during the conference. We'll cover more things. I think that I've run out of time here. God bless you.